Uh, we start to talk about the nervous system today, and by far, in I believe everybody is going to take NP2 here. Is that right? I mean, you're required to do that, okay? Or not, but you're going to, I suppose. So, volume wise, what we're going to talk about, what we're going to start talking about now, is the biggest topic it's nervous system. So, examine the nervous system is broken into three parts. We're going to talk about central nervous system first. Peripheral nervous system and reflexes second, and special senses third. So imagine that's one system that's comprised of three exams. It's huge. <clears throat> hmm? Three exams. So we get we split the nervous system into three topics. Okay, because it's enormous. And, you know, first thing I wanted to talk to you about is the general structure of that system. What nervous system consists of. And first, of course, the first thing that would come to mind is brain. Brain, together with the midbrain and the spinal cord, comprise central nervous system and that's going to be a first chapter in the discussion each part of the C and there you have a bunch of peripheral structures which we will cover timely just to give an idea CNS is only brain midbrain and spinal cord peripheral nervous system will be a topic of discussion in a separate occasion peripheral nervous system is essentially all your nerves and sensory receptors. Now, functionally, CNS is separated into three levels. The highest level in terms of the tasks and functions that it performs is cortical level. Essentially, it's your brain. And it kind of makes sense. Your conscious motor activities, thinking process, your personality is all in your brain. Midbrain, which can hardly be recognized in this picture, is responsible for a bunch of subconscious activities. Activities that you either not aware of or cannot consciously control or just don't think about which activities well kind of listed so it's kind of boring but think about this <clears throat> all visceral regulation your heart rate your blood pressure breathing rate um, digestive activities a lot of reflexes such as swallowing are regulated by the um, the midbrain and the brain stem does that make sense and finally, the spinal cord. Spinal cord that is often perceived as sort of a highway between the upper levels of the CNS. And periphery of the body also performs a lot of controlling activity. For instance, with the repetitive movements such as walking, running, swimming. Okay? It controls often local blood flow. It controls some digestive processes, digestive movements that are essentially visceral. So you can see that uh, all those parts of the CNS are critically important to regulate both conscious and subconscious activities. They are in control. Now, before we move on with um, the parts, before we move on to anatomy, and that's going to be quite a while, we're going to start with microanatomy of the nervous system. And we're going to talk about glial cells first. So, glial cells are the ones that allow neurons to perform their function. 
they do not participate in the process of information transmission okay they make sure that neurons are nourished protected myelinated so the most abundant type of glial cell is astrocyte it's called astrocyte because of its star-shaped you know appearance and it provides several um, supportive functions to the neurons first it keeps proper concentrations of ions and amino acids and, and glucose in the extracellular fluid the fluid that surrounds neurons Does that makes sense so pretty much astrocytes keep neurons nourished another important function that astrocytes perform is the maintenance of blood-brain barrier over here in this picture you can see capillaries the red portions that are surrounded by the projections okay of astrocytes and you can see that these projections wrap around each capillary essentially preventing transport of large molecules from the capillary from the blood into the extracellular fluid of the brain does that make sense so essentially blood brain barrier consists of two things one is the food processes of podocytes this you know projections and another is tight junctions i mentioned it before when we discussed epithelial cells so together tight junctions and food processes of sorry astrocytes prevent almost completely prevent transport uh, from blood to brain and back except for small lipid soluble molecules like oxygen or carbon dioxide or for that matter ethanol that's actually how ethanol gets in the brain now that actually represents a big challenge for pharmaceutical industry think about it if you want to treat some kind of um, brain tumor or any other brain disease you need to deliver the drug directly into the brain tissue okay now if this drug is fat soluble it would be awfully hard for the, such drug to stay in the blood do you see what I'm trying to say blood is water based okay now if you make it water soluble so the drug can be easily injected in the blood then it's really hard for this drug to get from the bloodstream into the brain because of the blood brain barrier it's kind of double-edged sword and it's not really easily solvable problem now astrocytes are present only in a central nervous system okay and the most common abnormality associated with astrocyte is astrocytoma easy please it's really d distracting okay. um, so astrocytoma is abnormal proliferation pretty much cancer when astrocytes start to uncontrollably divide okay to give you a perspective we cannot treat pretty much any brain cancer successfully it's really hard okay um, microglial cells are the relatives of macrophages they are immune cells essentially they protect neurons <clears throat> and they get rid of waste get rid of dead cells debris um, the downside of course is that they are residential cells they do not migrate you see what I'm trying to say they don't move yeah so they sit in the place which is kind of downside you know compare you have two armies one is moving and one is not obviously the moving army is winning so when pathogen gets into the brain microglial cells will try to get rid of it but if pathogen is motile and pathogen can move around then microglial cells 
are pretty much of no help in this case. They can also abnormally proliferate, causing microglioma, which in other words is called primary central nervous system lymphoma. They, it's pretty much the, the cancer of lymphatic tissue. Ependymal cells. <clears throat> yes. Yes. Uh -huh. Yes. No. Brief answer is no. We knew about microglial cells for a long time, and we did. They are not the anatomical part of the lymphatic system. Lymphatic system is in the brain is essentially a bunch of lymphatic vessels. Does that make sense? Like blood vessels, but lymphatic vessels. Microglial cells are in the brain tissue. I mean, I cannot reach for the brain model right there in the corner. Okay? You see the brain model sitting on the, on, on, on the counter? It's among others. So look, you have a neuron. You have a neuron, and you have microglial cell immediately next to it. So it's not a part of a separate like vessel. Did I explain it? Good. Ependymal cells. Your brain is cushioned. Did anybody saw the did anybody see the brain? Like actual brain. Huh? Okay, how does it look like? Is it solid? Is that not? Squishy. That's a good description. Brain is squishy. It's actually very, very fatty. And squishy. So if you put that squishy matter in the solid cranium, the skull, and start shaking it, without any protection. It's going to happen to that squishy matter. We get damage, right? So the brain in the skull is protected by the thin layer of cerebrospinal fluid. Essentially kind of floats the brain. You know, cushions it. That cerebrospinal fluid is produced by ependymal cells. <coughs> that essentially are ciliated columnar cells, but they have a very specific function to produce cerebrospinal fluid. They line the insides of so-called brain ventricles, empty spots, empty places in the brain that where cerebrospinal fluid is produced. Ependymal cells can overproliferate. That condition is called ependymoma. It's pretty rare. Okay, now, every neuron, not every, but most of the neurons in the central nervous system, most of the neurons, are myelinated. And we're going to talk about the role of the myelin in the um, function of the nervous system. We can sort of you know open it up step by step. So actually, let's figure it out. What is what is the type of signal that goes inside of the neuron? I mean, is that chemical? Is that electrical? Is that like temperature? Electrical, right? Your brain works you know by transmitting electrical impulses from one cell to another. Does that make sense? As with any electrical wire, you want to insulate, electrically insulate the axons of the neuron, the long projections of the neuron that transmit the electrical signal. Oligodendrocytes, they form layer for electrical insulation around neurons. Does that make sense? 
they prevent the leakage of the charge, the leakage of the electrical current from the neuron. Does that make sense to you? Okay. Now, oligodendrocytes can form oligodendroglioma, also fairly rare tumor of the brain. Oligodendrocytes can, um, can be found only in the central nervous system. However, the analogs, so-called Schwann cells, can be found in the peripheral. Does that make sense? So oligodendrocytes insulate neurons in the central nervous system. Schwann cells insulate neurons in the peripheral nervous system. And this differentiation, this distinction between oligodendrocytes and Schwann cells is important because these cells have a different function and they have different capacity for regeneration. Let me ask you something. You get really deep cut. Are you going to cut some nerves? Probably so. Probably so, right? When the cut heals, are they going to grow back? Well, they will. They absolutely will. Like, if you do really deep cut, deep wound, it grows back and you know, it heals, the sensitivity of your arm remains the same. That's abnormal lack of regeneration. Normally, nerves, peripheral nerves, grow back. You may have heard about people, you know, getting their limbs reattached. They gain control to the severe limbs if they reattached. However, if however, if the neuron in the CNS gets severed, it doesn't grow back. So if somebody gets the spinal cord cut, that's paralysis. Those neurons do not grow back. The reason for it, oligodendrocytes, these cells, cannot help neurons to grow. Schwann cells can. Do you understand the difference? Absolutely. Schwann cells are only in a peripheral nervous system. And they will help peripheral nerves to grow back. Oligodendrocytes are only in the central nervous system and they will not help the neurons to grow back. So once you cut them, you cut them. Well, oh, you. That is, that is slightly different because if you have pinched nerve, then um, it isn't dead, but the transmission of the signal is impaired. And considering the fact that every nerve that innervates certain part of the body consists of multiple fibers, okay? Uh, if you pinch, say, a cervical or thoracic nerve, like cervical 7, thoracic 1, parts of your upper arm are going to be affected, both sensory and motor. Because fibers that go to those nerves innervate arm. It's not going to be dead. But unless you remove that, that pressure on the nerve, you're going to lose some sensitivity and you're going to lose some motor control. And there is nothing to regrow because it's not completely severe. Does that make sense? <laughs> Sorry. And finally, the satellite cells can be seen here. Satellite cells surround the um, neurons in the peripheral nervous system and pretty much uh, perform the same function as astrocytes in a CNS. Before we move on, please know the types of the cells in the CNS and peripheral nervous system and what they do. You may get a question, this type of cells can be found in CNS and 
you know, provides electrical insulation for neurons, and you tell me that's oligodendrocyte. This type of cells, you know, nourishes neurons and keeps normal concentration of ions in extracellular fluid. That's astrocytes. Does that make sense? The type of question that I'm asking you about. Okay, good. Now, myelination, how does that work? Those cells, either Schwann cells or oligodendrocytes, essentially start to wrap themselves around the axon. Okay? And they wrap the membrane around the axon, the cytoplasmic membrane, several layers, and eventually they form so-called myelin sheath. You can see it right here in the picture, kind of colored it in blue. Myelin is the protein that essentially provides the electrical insulation to the axons. Does that make sense? Sometimes people produce autoimmune response to the myelin. What do you think is going to happen if your immune system starts to attack the myelin? And which quality will go away? Which feature will go away? Yes. Nope. Elect I, I'm not asking about, I'm going to tell you the name of the disease, but electrical insulation will be decreased and neurons that are supposed to be insulated electrically, when they are not, they do not transmit the signal as well. This disease is called multiple sclerosis. Okay? That's MS. Antibodies to your myelin sheath. We're good? So finally, neuron. Excuse me for a second. The most critical cell of the CNS. Only about 10% of all cells in the CNS are neurons. So you see the majority of the cells are glial cells and only a small portion of neurons. Neurons consist of several very distinctive parts. First part is the body of the neuron. The body of the neuron, which you can see on this model, I hope you can see this model. That's the whole thing is the body of the neuron that I'm covering with my, my hand. It's often called soma. That's the Greek word that you may want to remember. Anything soma means body. Somatic controls, controls of the body. Okay? Anything related to soma means body. That's soma. Yes. S-O-M-A. I put it right on top of the slide. Okay. Um, fairly short projections on the soma called dendrites. Dendrites, of course, the word comes from um, the Greek for tree. Okay. And on this model, you can see dendrites right here. Okay. Those little tiny projections. Sorry about that. Huh? Fuck me. That went on record. Projections here, okay? The white ones. Yes, the white ones. Not the not the beige ones. The white ones. The dendrites. Does that make sense? The third very distinctive part is the axon. That thing in the center is the axon. This is where it starts, and this is where it goes further. Does that make sense so far? So what are the functions? Think about this. The signal that goes through the typical neuron goes in one direction. And I'm going to repeat it to you on multiple occasions. 
one direction. It arrives on the dendrites. It can also arrive directly to the soma and in sort of infrequent cases to the axon. Okay? On this model, can you see those beige things, beige-like projections? Those are the places where the signal arrives on the neuron. Okay? Here, 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 here. It's all points where the signal arrives to the neuron. That signal uh, gets summed up on the body of the neuron and then at the beginning of the axon, the part that is called axonal HELOC, should be able to see axonal HELOC right here, okay? And then the resulting signal travels down from axonal HELOC to axon to the branches of axon, to the axonal terminals, which then transmit the signal to the next neuron. Essentially, if you would look at this model, signal arrives to the soma or dendrite the resulting signal goes from axonal HELOC to the axon eventually to the axonal terminals that transmit that signal to the next neuron does that make sense? And that signal goes through axonal HELOC to axon and so on and so forth. Please understand the sequence of the signal going through the axons. It arrives at dendrites or SOM or axon, sums up, and from axonal HELOC goes through the axon towards the next neuron and the next neuron. Does that make sense? Question? No? We good? All right. Yes. Terminals, yes. Neuron. Okay. Absolutely, yes. Other parts of neuron that you sh should know. Well, obviously nucleus. You can see nucleus on the model. And you can see nucleus on the picture. Very dense endoplasmic reticulum. Ag uh, neurons are extremely metabolically active cells, extremely metabolically active. So they have to produce a lot of protein, that's why a lot of uh, rough endoplasmic reticulum. Then, myelin, okay, so this picture shows you the neuron of peripheral nervous system. Do you see why? Why it's a neuron of peripheral nervous system? Schwann cells, yes. So the Schwann cells myelinate the axon. Does that make sense? Between the Schwann cells, you see the gaps. Each gap, right here, it's called node of Ranvier. These gaps enable a very special sort of transmission of electrical signal down the axon, which is called saltatory transmission, jumping transmission. We're going to talk about it um, a little later. One thing that I want you to pay attention to, look at this neuron that's on the picture is the entire cell myelinated. Nope. Which part is and which part isn't? Hmm? Axon is. Soma is not. What is the function of axon? What does it do? Yeah, it transmits the information, right? 
What is the function of soma? Receive and do what also? Kind of put it all together. Does that make sense? So let me tell you something. Myelin itself is white. You've heard about white and gray matter in the nervous system. Why do you think white matter is white? Because of what? I just told you. Because of what protein? What? The myelin, yes. White matter is white because of myelin. And gray matter is gray because it doesn't have what? Well, white matter. What does it consist of then? No, no, no. Structural parts, structural parts of neurons. What does it consist of? Axons. Gray matter. Which means which part? Soma. Bodies. Does that make sense? You see, so white matter is all axons. Gray matter is all neuronal bodies. What does that mean in terms of, you know, macro function? What would be the function of white matter? To transmit the signal. What would be the function of gray matter? To receive and interpret the signal. Does that make sense? So you see we just figured out based on the structure we figured out function. Right? Now Please know the parts of the neuron. Um, the lab is on the blackboard. It's like labeling stuff, you know, writing down the function. And eventually, you're going to have a quiz, of course. <clears throat> now, neurons structurally can be of three major types. It can be multipolar, bipolar, and unipolar. Multipolar... I mean, you open any, you know, popular book on nervous system or neurology or neuroscience, and that's what you're going to see. Does that make sense? Now, multipolar neurons, the most abundant and can be found in transmission of, let's say, motor output to the muscles. You can see that each multipolar neuron has multiple dendrites and multiple axonal terminals. Does that make sense? Bipolar neuron is a signal, signal, single dendrite and single axon, single dendrite that delivers the info to the cell and single dendrite single axon that delivers the signal to the next neuron. Now these guys are commonly found in sensory organs. For instance, in your retina, in your eye, one of the cell types is so-called bipolar cells, which are essentially bipolar neurons. Make sense? Terrific. Finally, unipolar neurons is when axon and dendrites are connected to each other and cell body is separated from it. Essentially, in this type of sensory neurons, which are responsible for somatic sensation. Now, I just, I keep throwing uh, terms at you, the words. What do you think somatic sensation means? which are senses of the body, which are pain, some pressure, that makes sense, any, huh? Temperature, does that make sense? So, like, touch, strong pressure, pain that can be inflicted on the skin, deep pain, sensations of your position, like if you bend your knee, and you don't see your knee, can you still tell yourself, oh, my knee's bent, right? That's 
um, kinesthetic receptor, receptor that you know tells you your position in space. Does that make sense? So those sensory um, signals go through the unipolar neurons. Understand the difference between these three types. Now we're going to start talking about the synaptic transmission. Neurons communicate with each other and with other cells by a synapsis. And I'm going to ask Ashley for some help, you know, to demonstrate everybody what the synapse is. I'm going to be a neuron, and Ashley's going to be a neuron, and this pen is going to be a signal. This is synaptic transmission. Take it from me. Did we touch each other? Did we have any actual contact? No. But we successfully transmitted the signal. Does that make sense? So in case of synaptic transmission, there is no actual physical contact between two cells. In case of synapse and uh, many other branches of biological science adopted the term synapse. In case of synapse, cells are separated physically by a tiny gap. And transmission happens in that gap. Are we clear on that? No physical contact. <coughs> Sorry. Most of the synapses that enable communication between the neurons are on the dendrites. Some synapses can be found on the soma. Soma, sorry, you can see this. Synapses on the soma. And some of them can be found on the hillock. The output of the neuron output signal goes into the single axon. Does that make sense? Synapse, sorry, neurons communicate with each other and transmit information. It's electrical impulses or so called action potentials. Okay? Important thing about synaptic transmission between neurons is that information can be summed up, can be blocked. Okay, uh, one good analogy, I think, in my opinion, is a punch. If you are punched one time, it may not be enough to knock you out, but if you receive multiple punches you will get severely beaten, right? So they get together. If you can protect yourself against the punches, they're not going to get any have any effect on you. Does that make sense? So those signals that are transmitted through synapses to a single neuron can come together and you know get amplified or inhibit each other. There are many options. Synapses can be chemical and electrical. So chemical synapses, you can see them here, to the left side of the slide in the left bottom corner. The idea of the chemical synapse is that electrical impulse in this neuron will lead to the release of chemicals into the synapse, into the so-called synaptic trough, okay, or synaptic cleft. And those chemicals will initiate electrical signal in the next neuron. Does that make sense? That's why the synapse is called chemical synapse. Do you follow me? I'm going to sum up the slide as usual. Electrical synapses is when two cells, although their membranes do not touch. They are connected to each other via ion channels, essentially by gap junctions. 
those gap junctions allow the flow of ions back and forth between the cells. Does that make sense? <coughs> this synopsis can be found in the smooth and cardiac muscle. Cells of the smooth and cardiac muscle can be connected by electrical synapses. Now, sort of a sum up. First, in synaptic transmission impulses can be summed up, can be can inhibit each other, can be blocked. Okay. Synapses can be chemical when electrical impulse leads to the release of chemicals into the synaptic cleft. Those chemicals in the synaptic cleft then stimulate the uh, generate electrical impulse in the next cell. Or synapses can be electrical, where you have a direct ionic flow between two adjacent cells that are connected by gap junctions. Another important feature, important difference of chemical synapses versus electrical. Electrical synapses allow signal to go both directions. You can imagine that signal may go from this cell, bottom cell, to the upper cell or from here to here. Okay, Either direction is fine. In case of chemical synapse, signal can go only one direction. There are no exceptions to it. Does that make sense? For instance, I don't know if you've heard this term. There's a word anterograde and retrograde transport. If you think about the neuron, in which direction the signal will go? Well, yeah, the way I hold it, it will go down, right? So that is often called anterograde. Some microorganisms, mostly viruses, that can infect nervous system, can transport themselves in the retrograde fashion, which means they sort of go against the flow. While the signal goes this way, virus will go backwards. Great example of such virus is the rabies virus. If you get bitten by a rabid skunk, rabid raccoon or rabid dog, you usually get bitten in the arm or in the leg, in the periphery of your body. When virus gets into the tissue, it infects neurons and then starts to move from the periphery to your brain in the retrograde fashion. Does that make sense? So it goes from axon to the dendrites to the next axon to the dendrites. It ends up in your brain and you die in horrible pain about two months after infection. Um, we're going to wrap it up because this will take good like 20 minutes. Okay? <laughs>